So thanks a lot, Karina and Jose, for inviting us. So I'm really pleased we are here today and we can give a talk about Campbell, our database that we work on. Um, and we talk about how we can access big molecular data via the web interface and the Campbell API. And as Karina already said, I'm Barbara Stratzil, and I'm here with my colleague uh, Fiona Hunter. And we both work in the Campbell team. So while I'm um, coordinating the Campbell releases, uh, Fiona is really responsible for the drug data in Campbell. Um, so I'm hoping you will enjoy our talk. So first of all, I want to give a little overview what we what you can learn today, basically. So I'll give a quite broad introduction into Campbell, and then I'll um, give you a tour through the Campbell web interface. And then after I have spoken, Fiona will take over and talk about the Campbell API mainly, and also show you the Campbell downloads. And then hopefully we'll have like 20 minutes in the end to answer questions. Um, but what can you expect from the main part? Um, so you can expect to learn what Campbell is, how Campbell is structured, how the data is curated in Campbell, um, how the data is extracted, um, also how drug data is curated and annotated. And I'll also very briefly cover another resource that we are maintaining, which is Unicam. So um, Campbell is basically a drug discovery database. So we'll cover basically all the different phases of the drug discovery process. And I'm sure many of you have seen this or a very scheme, a similar scheme before. So um, as you can see on the at the bottom, um, I'm not sure you can see my cursor actually. One second. So I think now you should be able to. So Campbell is at the moment 2.3 million compounds large. And the majority of the, those compounds, they are either extracted from the primary uh, scientific literature, so actually MedCam literature, or the other half of them is um, donated data sets from collaborators we have. Um, so this data covers like the stages of lead discovery, lead optimization, and preclinical development. But we also do have a lot of uh, data about uh, clinical candidates and drugs in Campbell. So at the moment, around 14,000 of these compounds are either clinical compounds or drugs. So the clinical, clinical compounds are extracted, for instance, from use and applications. So this stands for United States Adopted Name or from clinicaltrials.gov. And then we have around 3,000 uh, drugs from FDA. And what is also often not known to the public, uh, whereas we're not hiding it, but maybe maybe we should uh, advertise it a bit more. So Campbell also contains selected patent data from Shore Campbell. Um, Shore Campbell is another resource that we are maintaining. So that's our patent resource. Um, it contains at the moment around 25 million different patents corresponding to 25 million chemical structures. And of those, really only a very small proportion enters Campbell, so around 160,000 compounds. How do we actually select those patents that we manually curate and where we extract information from? So this is a, um, a collaboration we have with the Illuminating the Druggable Genome Project. So we identify basically targets that are not well represented in Campbell yet, so understudied targets. And we have a pipeline to identify patents that would uh, include information about such targets. And then we extract target and bioactivity information from those patents. So um, as I said, uh, Campbell is a drug discovery database. It's open, it corresponds to the FAIR principles. So findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable data. It's uh, of very high quality we think, and it's because it's manually curated largely. So we have, of course, our scripts and workflows, but a lot of the processes re really require a lot of manual intervention. And as I already mentioned, a lot of the data is extracted from the scientific literature, which you can see here. But uh, we also, as I said, have a lot of um, donated data sets. And if you look on the plot here on the right-hand side, here I plotted for the different Campbell releases starting from Campbell version nine that was released, I think in 2011. Um, so then we really started um, to distinguish between data from publications and data sets in Campbell. And you see 
On one hand, you see how uh, Campbell has grown over time, but you, what you can also see is the share. So now really more bioactivity data points in Campbell are actually from donated data sets and not anymore from the scientific literature. So that's also something that many people are probably not aware of. Um, so where do we get these donated data sets from? So we have um, certain collaborations with pharma industry, with some neglected disease organizations, like the Medicines for Malaria Venture. We have a collaboration with the Structural Genomics Consortium to put um, a chemical probe data into Campbell. And I also mentioned already, we have lots of drug and clinical uh, candidate data in Campbell. We have selected database, uh, databases and have entered Campbell in the past, like PubChem, BindingDB, but these are rather static. So while every Campbell release gets mirrored in PubChem at some point, we don't do this the other way around at the moment. And as I said, we have selected uh, patents as well. And uh, as for scientific literature, um, what I plotted here is the main journals we extract information from. So in total, we have more than 200 different uh, MedChem journals where, or maybe they are not all MedChem, but journals where we extract information from. But most of the information is extracted from like up to seven core journals, which include Journal of Medicinal Chemistry, Bioorganic Medicinal Chemistry Letters, and so on. So also Journal of Natural Products, for instance. So this has been mentioned yesterday also by Johannes Kirchmeier. And um, as you will see on the following slides, um, we extract all bioactivity information and all compound information from papers. And that's why, of course, not all the compounds that enter Campbell from this journal are natural products. Um, then also some statistics, which you can see on the top here. So the current Campbell release is 31. So you see how large it is already. I mentioned, um, I think already around 20 million activities, 2.3 um, million distinct compounds corresponding to 15,000 targets. And this is around 45,000 publications and almost 200 different deposited data sets. And so I haven't spoken yet about which data it is actually that Campbell hosts. So it's of course a bioactivity, a resource for bioactivity data. So we, we basically report how small molecules interact with protein targets. But this is actually just one portion of it, kind of maybe one third. The, uh, the rest is actually also data about how these compounds affect cells, organisms, and so on. So you will see later when I speak about different, for instance, target types, uh, how, how diverse the data in Campbell is. We also have the two-dimensional structures of the chemical compounds in Campbell and the calculated molecular properties. So uh, yeah, some selected properties that we think are useful. And we also have, as I said, a lot of drug and clinical candidate information, as well as their therapeutic indications. Um, so the diseases these drugs um, are used for, and in a lot of cases, also their non-therapeutic targets. So this might also be interesting for some of you who want to work with Campbell. So Campbell is a relational database. That means all the information that we expose to the public is stored in so-called tables. And you see it, it's quite large. So it has grown a lot over time. We at the moment expose 79 tables to the public. Internally, we have many, many more. Um, and here we structured the data here by a color code kind of in the diff, so as it fits together. But I zoomed in here to show you, for instance, some important tables that would um, contain the experimental data. So activities and essays, and you see there are different fields then in these tables. And these fields can be linked via their foreign and primary keys. And this is how you can query the database. So I don't think we will have time today to, um, to, to go into a lot of detail about how to query a database. But we have also on our website, we have a few tips about that. So I think that certainly if you want to do large queries, it's certainly worth downloading uh, your database instance. Um, and I will show you in the second part of, of my part of this presentation how you actually can query the web interface. But just um, already now, I want to mention that you, Campbell is very versatile also in the way how you can query it. So you can 
look for compounds, you can search for targets, assays, documents, cells, and tissues. And um, you have, if you search for a word, like for instance, dopamine, you will always get all the research uh, results displayed um, unless you search for a specific um, result only for targets, for instance. But I will show this a little later. But um, because first I want to explain you a little bit how um, the data that actually is displayed to you uh, on the web interface, for instance, how this actually, which a long journey it has to go until it's in that good quality that you can be using it. So the data, as I said, is partly extracted from the scientific literature. The other part is donated data sets. The data that comes from literature is ex um, extracted by our data extractors. And what they are doing is they read the full text articles and then they would extract the compound information. So the compounds that have been synthesized together with the assay description and they extract the target information and they extract all the quantitative bioactivity measurements that they can find in the paper. And what we then do is we put it in a very structured format. So that's a very simple representation here, but in that way, then you can query the data uh, as you want. Um, and after the data is um, extracted, I just wanna close this. I have, see a little tap, yeah. So, uh, um, so yeah, this is an example of what a typical paper might look like that we are using to extract the data. Um, so this is a data that really contains a lot of information. So on one hand, it contains target binding data, it contains functional assay data, it contains pharmacokinetic and toxicological measurements. So in that case, we would extract all the data from that paper. And this uh, gives you a, a good overview of the, the rich view of bioactivity data that you can have in Campbell. Um, what happens when we extracted the data is that we it's extensively curated. And on this nice overview picture, you can see um, all the different aspects of curation uh, that we do before you can actually publicly view the data. So on one hand, we, um, we standardize compounds, uh, we remove salts and so on. So I will go into detail about all these steps on the following slides. We also curate and standardize the bioactivities. We curate essays, map to ontologies, and we assign targets and also here map to certain ontologies. So speaking about chemistry curation, um, there we developed um, a pipeline um, that is also publicly available on GitHub. And there has been a paper published in 2020. That, so that was clearly before my time at Campbell. Um, so, but it's available for use. So you can download this uh, Python script and use our standardizer if you wish so. What it does, it um, does an automated error checking. It standardizes compounds and it also strips salts. Why are we doing this? So in a, in a paper, often the chemical compound is reported as a salt and it's associated bioactivity. And we strip the salt and then call this the so-called parent compound. And we then actually record both um, both in the Campbell database. And that's then easier also if you look for similar compounds, right? You can compare on the basis of the parent compound, for instance, the bioactivity values. We also calculate um, certain compound properties um, that we display on the website, as you will see later. And we manually curate also invalid structures. So if we find an an incorrect structure or one of our users. So we have a help desk um, that we, I also displayed it on the very first slide of this presentation. It's Campbell minus help at EBIAC UK. So if you have a question, um, um, write to the help desk. So if somebody reports an invalid structure, our chemistry curator will look at it. We then also look at name to structure mismatch, mess, uh, mismatches, and we are also correcting missing stereochemistry. Um, as for activity curation, I think that's a quite important topic. Um, you, you know already that, okay, Campbell hosts a lot of different types of activity data, right? Quantitative, but also sometimes qualitative uh, bioactivity measurements, um, like histopathology observations, for instance. But a large proportion of the data in Campbell really is, a do is those response measurements against protein targets. 
So typically, for instance, we um, what is measured is an IC50 value, for instance. This is the half maximal inhibitory concentration. And, uh, but you also have other uh, units, um, uh, not only units, but also by activity types um, like KI values, KD and so on. And to be able to compare those different activity types, but also compare data across different assay setups, you, what we provide to the users is a so-called P Campbell value, which is the negative logarithmic representation of the bioactivity value. Uh, in molar. So a P Campbell of nine is equivalent to one nanomolar. And this really allows you to nicely compare now across assays. But I have to say it's a very rough measure. So if you do regression analysis, you should actually just use um, data from the same assay or, under the, or measured under the same assay conditions. But maybe for um, binary classification, you can combine different assays. Um, what we also do is we standardize activity types. So you see there are so many different ways that data sometimes enters our database. We anti-log values. So if like a PKI, for instance, is reported, we would convert it back to KI. We standardize values and units to nanomolar. And we also flag potentially incorrect data. So we have set certain ranges for certain activity types. And if we think that looks like out of range, we would flag it. Then, as I said, we calculate P Campbell values. And another interesting thing we do is we flag potential duplicates. What do I mean by that? So um, imagine that somebody publishes for a certain compound target pair a bioactivity value. And then in another publication, people would use this as a standard, like as a reference, and also report it in their paper and would also measure new compounds. So they would report a bioactivity value from another paper, but our data extractors wouldn't really um, flag that. And so that what we do is we, we basically check if the same compound, same target, and same activity type appears in two different publications, then we would flag those compounds or those by activity values actually. Um, it's also very important that you understand um, what the Campbell target types are. Uh, so also to understand how we assign those target types. Um, so it's very tempting to think that all the targets are single proteins. So there are some, but it's actually quite a minority if you look at whole Campbell. So on one hand, we can have um, protein targets, but it's not always single protein. So you can, in some cases, have a protein complex. So you need two subunits, for instance, for an inhibitor to bind. Sometimes the target is a protein-protein interaction. That would mean that, for instance, your uh, inhibitor prevents um, this protein-protein interaction, for instance, to happen. Then this is the target. Then sometimes it can be a little bit more fuzzy. So like for GABA-A receptors, you don't really know on which subunit this was tested. So then we would assign a protein complex group. And the same can be true for a whole protein family if it was measured against the whole protein family. But we don't only have protein targets in Campbell. So sometimes they are of a different nature. And I actually checked that yesterday because I wanted to see from the 20 million bioactivities we have now in Campbell, how many are actually protein targets or how, how many bioactivities uh, have been measured on protein targets. And I found that 8 million of those have been measured on protein targets and the remaining 12 million on other, other targets. And this includes DNA targets, ribosome, or even small molecules can be targets. For instance, if like an antibody drug binds to a small molecule. Um, and then also we have non-molecular targets, like if this is an assay set setup uh, where something is measured in a cell line, in an organism or a tissue. So these can also be targets. And it's quite important to understand those concepts. Also for the curation, it's important to understand those concepts. So when we curate the data, and that's what I wanted to show you so you get a little bit of an impression how complex this is. So our curation takes like three to four months for every release. Uh, and what we do here to curate the assays, we have different notebooks for the different types of targets. So the tissue-based uh, assays, cells, organisms, and so on. And we curate them independently. 
Um, so that's the different target types. We we then standardize and correct names for tissues, cell lines, and so on. And we would um, map to the um, to the uh, control vocabularies, so to ontologies like Euberon, Cellosaurus. So we have a large collection of ontologies we are using here. We also map the essay formats to the BAU ontology, um, and we're working on improving this a little bit further. And so both the target type is extracted from the essay description, but also the essay type. And you might have heard of this already. So in Campbell, we don't only have binding data, right? I've mentioned this when I was talking about the different um, bioactivity types also that can be in a paper, right? Or or assay data. So bind, there can be um, the binding assay. So you basically measure binding of a compound to a target. It can be a functional assay. So you measure the biological effect of a compound um, uh, and yeah, other types as well, like toxicity, ADME and FISCHEM. So we have lots of different assay types in Campbell just to be aware of this. And this is an example that I wanted to bring up to show you um, how we do mapping here to ontologies. So just one example for tissues, so that you get a feeling how we are doing this. So the depositor, they would probably give us a description, for instance, half-life in human blood uh, is the description of the, of, um, of the tissue here. And no, the tissue is whole blood, and that was the description. And then we extract and map to the right ontology. So we map to Uberon, and then the standard term is actually blood. And in some cases, we even have a subcellular fraction. So it's liver microsome, then the tissue is liver, and we also extract the subcellular fraction, which is microsome. So lots of manual curation and mapping goes into this. Uh, and then finally, um, I also wanted to show you uh, how rich uh, Campbell is in terms of the drugs and clinical candidate data that it contains. Um, so that's the really the part of Campbell that Fiona and her team works on. And it's also a very uh, lengthy process, actually. Um, but it leads to a really nice resource of drugs and chemical compounds, uh, can, cl clinical candidates in Campbell. So on the left-hand side, you see the variety of different resources that we extract this information from. So for instance, FDA Orange Book uh, for approved drugs and then clinical trials, for instance, uh, for clinical candidates and use and applications as well. And then there are others like Daily Made for indication information. So all this is kind of curated and mapped together. And I'm sure Fiona can tell more in the remaining minutes in the very end, if you want to know more. Uh, but once we have gathered all this data, we do four types of annotations. So on one hand, we need to map to a chemical structure. So often we just have the drug names and no chemical structure. Then we annotate the diseases um, and we annotate the mechanism of action. So on one hand, the indication, right, for which this drug is approved um, or uh, in the clinical trials for, and the mechanism of action is actually the, the therapeutic target that this drug or clinical candidate is, is acting on. And then we also assign the drug properties, um, and I will show you this in a minute. And, but it's also important to mention that this drug uh, and clinical candidate information is, is entering Campbell, but it also enters the open targets platform. Um, so drug properties, as I just mentioned, um, so this we display in Campbell as well for the drugs and clinical candidates. Um, so you see the green uh, kind of buttons and the blue ones, so or icons. So the green icons are all the molecule-based uh, properties that we assign to basically all clinical stage compounds, and the blue ones are only for approved drugs. So green, these are certain icons for reflecting what molecule type is it. So is it a small molecule, an antibody, a protein, and so on? Then is it compliant with the rule of five? Is it the first uh, in class uh, drug, so to say? Is it um, so? Yeah, is it a chiral, racemic, or achiral compound? Um, and also, is it a prodrug or not? And then this 
product-based properties, the blue icons, this uh, report uh, uh, about uh, root of administration. So is it orally, parenteral, or topical administered? And so these are these three icons. And then does it have a black box warning? And then how, how available is it in the sense, do you need a prescription like here that would be for prescription? Or is it an over-the-counter product like aspirin? So I I selected two examples because they are both orally uh, applied and they are both small molecules and are uh, compliant with the rule of five. But what is different is that celecoxib has a black box warning, and but aspirin doesn't. And aspirin can be um, just bought without a prescription in the pharmacy. But for celecoxib, at least in Europe, you need a prescription. Okay, and um, then I also wanted to mention another resource that we are maintaining, which is called Unicam. And it's important to mention it because it's also a very important resource in connection with Campbell, because it's our mapping system, right? So it was initially basically just developed as a cross-reference system internally in the European Bioinformatics Institute to, to uh, cross-reference uh, all the ligand resources that where they are like KB, Array, Express, and so on. But now it links out to many more resources. So it's now 40 different sources that are linked and how the compounds are linked are via um, standardized inches. Um, so it hosts 170 million compounds at the moment. And how you can use it is you can either, for instance, enter a Campbell ID and then see which databases have data for that um, compound but you can also just enter an inchi key, for instance. And this is to show you how uh, the results are displayed. So this is on the left-hand side, the programmatic output that you get from Unicam, either in JSON or XML format. But we also use the Unicam results for rendering our Campbell interface. So actually the cross-references section on um, that uh, on the compound reports card. And I will show you this a little bit later. So on the compound report card, you can then link out to other resources. And so this was the first, first part of my uh, presentation. I think it's a lot of information, but as we said in the beginning, you can always get back to us uh, and, and also contact the help desk if you need more information. Um, so now in the second part of my talk, I just want to give you a brief walk through the Campbell web interface, because the Campbell web interface has really um, been improved a lot over the last couple of years. So probably some people are not aware that this is really a nice uh, way to also filter down the data set that you can later import into maybe a workflow system like NIME and use further. So if you don't have any programmatic yeah, skills, you, uh, or you don't have programmatic access, you don't know scripting, you can just also use the web interface for many things, you know, not maybe for very yeah, large or complicated queries, but certainly for many queries. So what you can see on the main homepage is um, on one hand here on the top, you, you we link out to other resources. And then you here you have these interactive plots here. Um, and these are actually clickable. I'm not sure if this is always, um, yeah, if, if people would know that. So you can click on them and then you would, if you click on essays, you would directly be directed to the essays, uh, to the essay data, or you click on compounds and you're directed to the compound data. You can also click here on browse all, all Campbell and you, can, um, and you also get all the Campbell data basically, uh, or you do a keyword search here. And this I want to show in a bit more detail. So for instance, if you um, type into the search box dopamine, it will give you back all the different um, possible entries for dopamine. Like it looks for dopamine in essays, for dopamine in compounds, documents, or targets. And then uh, depending on what you're interested in, you can just go to a certain section or you just hit enter and then all the results are displayed. So then you get all the results which are more than 9,000. And then, but you also see on this search, uh, on these tabs here, you can also directly go to compounds from your targets and the S's and documents, 
but now all the results are displayed. So you would need to scroll down and then first compounds, then targets, then essays, documents, and so on would be listed. But now let's look into targets. So if you would go to the targets tab, um, so then the targets would be listed on top now. And so now you see the different targets for dopamine. Uh, so dopamine receptor is here listed, for instance. And uh, what you can then do is you can click out, but I will show this later as well. You can click on the target Campbell ID and then you would end up and see all the different um, data for this target. Um, so what I also wanted to show you is from this um, search box here, there's also the possibility to, to do an advanced search. So if you just click on advanced search, then this window uh, pops up actually. And there you can do a similarity search or a substructure search or a connectivity search. And how you're doing this is by either entering um, a SMILES code, for instance, or you draw a chemical structure. Uh, if you want to do a connectivity search, that basically means it looks for all um, almost identical uh, chemicals, but maybe with different stereochemistry. So it, it, it gives you back all the search results where the same atoms are connected in the same manner. Um, you can also do a similarity search um, and then just um, also select a threshold for the similarity search in terms of a Tanimoto coefficient. You can do a substructure search, then it would look for all compounds which have this particular substructure. Yeah, then you have to wait a bit and then it would give you back all these search results. So now you see these are these little cards here with the different search results. So you get, for instance, all the compounds containing this substructure now, if you did a substructure search. Um, and what you then can do is you can uh, also switch the view. So now it's the cards view. You can also go to the table view, graph view or heat map view. I will show you those in a minute. Um, you can also apply certain filters here and you can zoom in and out of this card view. Um, and what I also wanted to show you is a little bit uh, how you can navigate um, a little bit better here. So, um, so I already mentioned, so imagine you were searching for a particular target. So we are again here with our example of dopamine receptor. So um, how can you now um, look for bioactivity data, for instance? So you can either um, click on the, on the target Campbell ID here, and then you would end up, you would see the um, target report card. You can then scroll down and would see also the bioactivity chart view. You could also, um, from the target, um, click on these histograms that actually show you the distribution of compounds and activities. So you can also uh, enter the data here or look for compounds, look for activities. What you else can do is you can um, click on this little show or hide columns button. And this enables you to display more columns if you're not satisfied with what is displayed here. Um, you can also browse activities by uh, pressing this button here. You can, of course, download the data in CSV or TSV format. And as I already mentioned before, you can filter here. Um, so th these filters, of course, um, are customized in the sense that if you have, if you look now at targets, it will only show you filters that make sense in the context of targets, like you can uh, filter for a certain organism, for instance. Um, you can also change this view to a heat map view. Um, and, oh, sorry, that was a mistake actually. Yeah, but I will show you this a little later. Um, so when we look now at the compound card view, um, that's another way to look at compounds. What you can do here is you can um, zoom in and out a little bit. And here you see, so that's the main difference. So if you look at targets, you just can look at cards and tables. But if you look at compounds, you can also look at heat map and graph views. And this is what I wanted to show you actually. So the compound property or graph view gives you the opportunity to plot your compounds in a two-dimensional space. 
So you can select certain FISCAM properties here. We plotted A log P versus molecular weight. Uh, and this would now plot all your compounds. So in this case, we have 41 different compounds. And this really helps you also to narrow down your data set. So if, for instance, you only want compounds that are falling within the, um, the, the limitations of the rule of five, like for instance, you would uh, want to choose those that have a molecular weight below 500 and an ALOP below five. You could uh, mark those and you could then go back to the card view and then this would be selected. And this is actually what I wanted to show you before, the heat map view. So this doesn't exist for, for the targets, but only when you enter it from the, the compound view. Um, so after searching for compounds. And this is a little bit special because this gives you not only the opportunity to see the all measured compounds against targets, but it also gives you a sense of the potency that was measured. So what is displayed here in a color code are the peak Campbell values and the dar darker the color, uh, the higher the potency of the compound. And it also gives you a feeling of which measurements are kind of missing. So which compound targets pair, uh, for which compound targets pairs you don't have measurements or maybe you have other types of data so that don't provide or lead to a P Campbell value in, in, in Campbell. So this sort of analysis might help you to um, learn something as well about selectivity. Okay, uh, and a little bit, this was covered already before. So, um, so how to basically retrieve bioactivity data. I think I've mentioned most of this already. Um, but there are so many different ways to do that. So you can, on one hand, if you search for a target like cannabinoid uh, CB2 receptor here, you can, on one hand, just click on this histogram that displays the different activity types. So these different colors are really the different uh, activity types. So if you just click on one, it would just uh, you would just get to the data for this activity type. Or you click on the target, the Campbell target ID, Campbell 253, which then leads you to the, to the target report card. And then you get this nice uh, pie chart view where you can then also see, you know, this is um, there you can see the different activity types and you can just click on one of them or on all and then you would get to the, to the corresponding bioactivity data page. Or you can also uh, see the bioactivity data by just going to browse activities. So there are many ways. Okay, so how is Campbell bioactivity data displayed? So this is a very a wide um, um, table basically, and it covers a lot of information that is actually necessary in the context of, bio, of reporting bioactivity data. So you have um, the compound information on the left-hand side, then there is the activity information, so all the measurements and all the relevant information um, according to that. So also like the standard type, for instance, like IC50KI and so on. Then the assay relevant information, including assay description, assay organism and so on. The target that this has been measured on and the source that's, for instance, um, the document ID that this was extracted from. Uh, and I forgot, um, you can also filter this data, sort the data, and download the data in a flat file format. Um, and then finally, let me show you briefly the target and compound report cards, what a rich source, source of information they are. I'm sorry, it's a bit dark here already. So the target report card um, summarizes basically all the information we have in Campbell for a respective target. So uh, we selected a target here that is a protein complex. So that's this integrin alpha 4 beta 7 um, complex. And you can see here in the target report card, um, the type is protein complex. And because it's a protein complex, we also have information in this components table here. So the two different components that build up this protein complex and also the links to the uniprot accession numbers. In relations, we basically list all other targets in Campbell that have one or both components somehow included. 
uh, then if you scroll further down and if this target um, is a target for a drug or a clinical candidate reported in Campbell, then we also would find this information here. Um, and we also display information about the ligand efficiency uh, of the compounds measured against those targets. So you might have heard about ligand efficiency, but that's basically the potency of a compound um, but um, divided by its size, so by its heavy atoms, so that um, you can really compare which one is the most potent compound independent of its size. Uh, and also we have these activity charts. So um, if you scroll further down, you have these interactive charts for activity data that are clickable again, and you would get to the um, by activity information if you click on them. And then at the very bottom of this target report card, we have all the cross-references. So they link out to other gene, protein, or structure resources, as you can see here. So a lot of them are internal resources like intact, open targets, reactome. And then uh, finally, the compound report card. So this looks fairly similar to the target report card. So also here, um, yeah, it's similarly structured. The compound structure is depicted, and you can also see the structural representations, uh, economical smiles, and inchy. Uh, standard inch and standard inch key. We uh, display uh, the name and uh, so the preferred name and the different synonyms and also its development uh, phase. So is it an, four means it's an approved drug actually. So this is sealed in a field. We also display alternative forms of this compound or drug. So I've told you in the beginning when we curate the compounds, we would uh, strip the salt and then we would store both the salt form and the parent compound. Um, I also already talked about these molecule features so they are also displayed on the compound uh, report card if it's a drug or a clinical candidate uh, and then also if it's falling within this category drug or clinical candidate you can also see the mechanism uh, of action so the yeah the curated uh, target, actually the therapeutic target and the action type, as well as the indications. So what disease is this drug used for? And finally, um, um, we also show structural alerts. So any substructures that are associated with toxicity or S interference. So that's not a black white thing. So just because a compound um, contains this substructure, it doesn't mean it has to create problems, but it's maybe something you want to be aware of. And then we finally have this metabolism, um, metabolic pathways curated for some of the drugs. And also when you scroll further down, you see the activity charts again, where you can directly link out to the activity. Um, and then at the very bottom, you can also see the properties of that compound. So some of the selected, um, some properties we actually pre-calculated for you and you can um, really um, already retrieve this information here. And what I mentioned in the beginning or when I talked about Unicam, so here we, we render this information about the cross-references uh, in Campbell. So you can link out to the different um, resources here. And that's my final slide before I give over to, um, to Fiona. So uh, Fiona is actually the expert on drug data in Campbell, but I just wanted to show you that if you want to query drug data in Campbell, um, the best way to browse it is right directly via these interactive um, charts here. So you can basically click on drugs indications or mechanisms. So if you click on drugs, for instance, you'll get all the, uh, the, the drugs, the 14,000 drugs that you then can further filter down. You can also do a text search. So if you would enter here antibody, you would only get the antibody drugs, for instance. And you can then also browse those um, drugs and browse by mechanism or indication. And now I want to hand over to my colleague Fiona. And um, uh, I want to thank you for listening. So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dr. Fiona Hunter, and I also work as part of the Kemble team. 
So thank you very much to Barbara for providing such a nice introduction to Kemble and all the data that we have and giving the overview of the web interface, which is shown on the top left of that slide there. Now, there are many different ways to access the data in Kemble. So the web interface is, is a very good starting point. But if you look at the, the bottom left of this slide, you can download the whole database in various different formats. Um, we recommend that if you're not used to downloading the whole database, it is very large. So we recommend that you use SQL Lite because that's a, a simple way to access it using one file and you don't need a driver, for example, if you're accessing it from, from Python. Equally, um, you can access Kemble, you can download Kemble or access it through the semantic web as an RDF. And then today in the top right hand corner, I'm going to talk in a little bit more detail with examples about the web, web services. So there are lots of different API endpoints that you can use to access the information. Next slide, please. So the API endpoint. So the first thing is when should you use the API and when would be better to use a different method to access the data? So if you have a repeat, if you wanted to use a repeatable query or to embed your query, for example, in a script, then use the API. Equally, if you don't want to download the full database, you can use the API. Or for example, if you want to access the information easily, but using a URL, so using a web link, link then use the API. However, if you only need to access a small amount of information, so for example, like the examples that Barbara has shown, if you have just one compound or one target, then just use the web interface. It's very nicely dis displayed and presented and you can do quite a lot with it for initial and exploratory investigation. However, if you need to run multiple queries with lots of input data, or you've got very complex queries, for example, if you're querying across lots of different tables within the underlying SQL relational database, then you need to download the database and construct an SQL query. And equally, if you need data that's from a previous release of Kemble, currently we're on Kemble 31, then you have to download the database because the API and the web interface only show data for the current release. Next slide, please. So how does it look? Barbara's already shown you what the web interface looks like for, in this example, a compound report card for acetaminophen. Um, so that's nicely formatted and easy to view. Next, please. If you want to access the same information through Kemble Web Services, then you need to plug in a URL that's shown in blue at the top there. And I'll talk through the, the, um, this in a little more detail in the following slides. But what you get back is this um, information that's the same as on the left hand side of the slide, but it's in a computer readable output. So you can understand it as a human, but it's not particularly easy to look at. Next slide, please. And the API documentation, we've got lots of resource and, and examples to look at. So I can point you towards this resources page, which you access from the main Campbell site. Next point, please. Or equally, what can be very helpful if you want to look at the API information is to use our interactive API documentation. So in this, you, you click on one of those get buttons for the appropriate endpoint, plug in the data that you're interested in, and it will provide you with the output that you would see. So it's a quick way to check. Next slide, please. So this is an example, again, of what the output would look like for the activity endpoint. Next point, please. And I point you to the bottom, this little inset that says page meta. So this is right at the bottom of a, the web page for an API endpoint. And it tells you that on this page, there are it's showing information for 20 records. That's the limits 20, but the total count is 350. So there are 350 pages, each containing up to 20 records. So there's more information than what you just initially see. And that's useful when you're starting to access the data programmatically. And I'll show you a method to access all the data in, in one go 
or if you don't want to use the, the Kemble Python client that I'm going to sh um, show you, then just bear this in mind when you're accessing the, this type of API programmatically. Next slide, please. So we've got a variety of different endpoints. The first question is, well, which, which endpoint do I need? So as Barbara showed you, we have um, six different main Kemble entities for compounds, targets, assays, documents, cells, and tissues. So each of those have their own equivalent API endpoint with relevant data included. At the bottom there, we have a further one for activities. Next, please. And then we have additional endpoints, API endpoints for things like uh, compound similarity, document similarity, Kemble ID lookup, and there are more than this. Next point, please. And then further, there is information specifically for drugs. So that's for drug um, drugs themselves, for drug mechanisms, drug indications, that's which disease the drug treats, or drug warning information, for example, whether that drug is withdrawn from the market for a safety reason or carries a black box warning for a severe or life-threatening outcome. Now, just remember, if you're looking at the drug API endpoint in this one, unusually, we aggregate all the data on the parent compound. Um, so that's a slight difference to the other endpoints. Next slide, please. So formatting an API call. So the, the URL pattern that we see at the top there, um, it looks slightly intimidating to start with, but we can break that down and I'll explain the different bits. So next point. So first of all, in on the left hand side, we have the stem and this remains the same regardless of which um, API you're looking at if you want to look at the Kemble data. Next point. Then we're going to look at the API endpoint called molecule for pulling back compound information. So this is the resource. And then we put a question mark in, which means filter. So next point, please. So we're going to filter for a field, which is called pref underscore name. So pref name, next point. Um, and then the type of filter we're going to look for. So we're going to look for a word called acetaminophen within the pref name. And then um, so we're using the filter type I contain, so it's case insensitive. Next point. And I'll just point out now while we're going through it. So pref name has a single underscore between it. So that's a field name itself. And to distinguish that from the connection to the filter type, then there's a double underscore. So just watch with your formatting of these type of URL strings. Last point for this, please. So then we're searching for acetaminophen as the value. Next point. So there's lots of different types of filters that you might use. So contains is one of them, starts with regex, and there are more. Please go and look at the Kemble Data Web Services information. And again, if it's case insensitive, you put an I before it. And then the formatting, you can, at the end of this, you can order the the um, re records that come out, um, you can order them by the pref name, which would be alphabetical, but if you put a minus in front of it, then you'll get uh, descending. Uh, so reverse alphabetical uh, order would come back. And equally, you can format the results that you get in various different ways. XML is the default, but you might want JSON or YAML, and then in brackets there, you've got SVG, so that produces um, potentially an image of a chemical structure or SDF, which would be the, the representation of the mole file of the, the chemical structure in a computable computer readable format. Next slide, please. So we're going to walk through uh, one example that's got two different parts to it when we use the API to explore drug target disease relationships. Next slide, please. So in, uh, this is the general approach that we're going to use for these API examples. So uh, the setup here, I would use a Jupyter Notebook and then Python 3. Equally, to make it easy to view the data in tables, that I would import the Pandas module um, to Python. And then we, you would need to install the Kemble Python client. And the reason for doing this is that it's tailored to Kemble and it makes it very easy to use. So you type in pip install kemble underscore web resource underscore client, and that's accessible from the web link there that's shown on um, the third row down. However, 
if you don't want to use Python, then you may want to use a request module for a different language, for example, and therefore you may not need to use the Kemble Python client, you might want to use something else. There are other ways of accessing the same information, but not necessarily using the approach that I'm going to show you. And at the very bottom there, there's a note that the, there's an example Jupyter notebook available. If you go to the link on, um, on GitHub, and that's got lots of different examples in it of using the Kemble Python client for lots of different tasks. Next slide, please. So here's our example here. So what we want to do is we want to find druggable therapeutic targets for the disease schistosomiasis. The, so this schistosomiasis is a really horrible disease. It kills around 250,000 people every year and it causes um, severe, uh, so it's a parasitic worm, it's an infection and it causes anemia and stunting and impedes the cognitive development in children. It affects the development of immunity and allergies and it increases susceptibility to HIV and to AIDS, so it's a really nasty disease. So the schistosome worm, um, the blood flukes from that infect more than 200 million people every year. But there's only currently one drug available on the market called Praziquantel. So the question here is, because we don't know very much about the complex life cycle of this parasitic flatworm, can we find a target where we um, could potentially develop a, a new drug for that? So recent genomic analysis revealed there are around 2,300 cystosome genes, and there's a couple of references that were in science um, within the last few years. But the, how on earth do we know which of those 2,300 genes we should start to look at to target? Next point, please. So what we really need is a list, a prioritized list of which of these genes are druggable. And if those genes are druggable, do they have existing drug information about them? Is there a, a drug which is already on the market for a different disease that we might be able to repurpose to, to um, try and, and treat schistosomiasis? Next point, please. So the task is to take a list of genes and find compounds which are active on these genes. Next, please. And then to look, are any of these compounds progressing through clinical trials at the moment, or are there any drugs already on the market for one of these genes? Next slide, please. So the work, what we do to start with is we're going to use the activity API endpoint. So we're going to find targets with active compounds. So first of all, we take... Um, the, the activity endpoint, and then we're going to filter it by a list of targets. In this example, I've taken um, just a, a couple of those out of this very long list of genes. So serine threonine protein kinases, that's STK25 and TAO1, 2 and 3. And I had a look and checked what their Kemble identifiers are. So there's a list of four Kemble identifiers there. Next point. So for the, the genes that we're looking at, we want compounds that are active. So remember what Barbara explained before, we're going to look for a p Kemble value because that's a good estimate to start with. And we're going to look for compounds where the bioactivity data is less than 10 micromolar. So that's greater than or equal to 5 p Kemble. Next point. And we want to look for binding assays. So we're going to take that information and encode it into the URL. Next, please. And again, and again. So we've got, as before, we've got the URL string. Next, please. And then we're going to look at the resource, which is the activity endpoint, and then put in the question mark for filter. Next, please, and again. And then we've got a list of targets. So here, the field um, name is target Kemble ID, and then we've got double underscore in with a list following, so a list of Campbell identifiers after that, all in blue. Next, please. And then we're going to join that to the next filter, which is the activity threshold in pink here. So we say P Campbell value, and then we've got a double underscore GTE is greater than or equal to five, because that's equivalent to 10 micromolar. And then we're gonna have another join 
because we want to link it to the final bit, which is we only want to look for a binding assay. So we say assay type equal to B. So we encode all that and type it in and see what we get. So next slide, please. So we're going to set up the call. So I would be doing this in the Jupyter notebook. So this time we're going to take the URL string that we um, went through on the previous page, but put it, uh, apply it using the Kemble Python client. So we take the same information and write it slightly differently. So here we've got four different lines. First of all, we're going to filter in blue on the targets and then the P Kemble value greater than or equal to five, the ASCII type equal to B, and the last three lines there, we only want to pull back the data fields that we're interested in. So we use this other keyword dot only with a list of um, database fields that we're interested in. Next point, please. So that returns something like this and you go, well, that's fine. I can read it, but it's not very easy to actually look at or interpret. So next point, please. So what we do instead is we convert the string that came back into a pandas data frame. So um, next point, please. And then uh, when we look at the results now, it's, it shows it very nicely formatted. We've got uh, all the different targets that we're interested in, a list of molecules and their peak amble value, clearly showing that the peak amble is much greater than five. So they've got a good binding to the target. Next, please. So we're going to do the same thing now for the second point of our of our task. So to look for which compounds have the most potential as drugs. So we're going to set up the call again using the Kemble Python client, but this time looking at the molecule API. So here we're going to encode, we're going to take some of the molecules that we um, were the results from the previous slide and look for those and only look for a few database fields that are relevant the names of them and some of their molecule properties. Next point, please. So we're gonna do the same as before, convert the results into a list and we get what looks like initially quite a nice table, but then when we look at molecule properties and molecule hierarchy, some of the data there is nested. So we need to include one further step to actually pull out the detail of this. Next point, please. So instead, we'll write a further line of code for the, um, the database fields that we're interested in that will pull out the nested structure and look for just the individual relevant data. Next point. And we can see in the end that um, for the, the selected molecules that we were looking at, the bottom two rows there for sinitinib and neratinib, they have max phase four. So that means that these are drugs which are approved potentially for a different indication, they're already on the market. And then there's some detail there about their physical chemical properties. So the molecular weight, PSA is the polar surface area, and log P, which is a measure of whether it's um, absorbed into the aqueous or the organic phase. So the, the bottom two lines there would be, potentially could be investigated as possible um, new treatments for this nasty disease, schistosomiasis. That's the end of these examples. Next slide, please. So overall, here are some best practice ideas for things that you should do if you want to use an API. So first steps, use the web interface. It's best to do initial exploration in something that's easy to understand visually. And then when you've got something that you think you're interested in, then progress on to the API. When you want to get started with the API, then just look at some example URLs. For example, take the molecule endpoint or the target endpoint, return all the compounds and see what database fields are there. One of the key things that is very helpful to do is to check the data output. It's a very good plan to spot check what is being brought back from the API. For example, if you've got one compound, have you got all the relevant information that you would expect? Is something missing? Have you got activity data for both the parent and the salt drug forms? Or have you missed a bit of it? That's quite a common thing to do when you're looking at compound information is to look at one salt, but forget there's um, there may be other relevant bioactivity data that's on a different salt form within the same compound family. There is a schema description available for the API, but I actually find it easier to just go and look at, at, at an actual example and see what the data is. 
And then the final point here is try it out interactively, use our interactive API documentation. It's quite straightforward to use. So just plug it in and, and see what happens. Next slide, please. So that's um, hopefully a, a useful overview of the Kemble and Unichem resources. Here are some links that can give you further information. So at the top here, we have webinars that are available through Embl EBI where we work. So the first one is a Campbell webinar, which is a broad introductory one. There is, in addition, a specific API webinar for Campbell. There's a quick tour where you can um, access information in a bite-sized format without having to, to sit or watch through a whole hour of webinar. We have a lot of documentation. There's documentation on the Campbell web services and on Unicam documentation that was mentioned by Barbara as well as this useful compound mapping resource. Then if you want to download the data, we have FTP sites for both for Unicam and then for Kemble, where you can access the current release, but all the other releases of Kemble as well. And then one of the main things to mention again is please contact us. There's a, an email there, there um, kemble-help at ebi.ac.uk, and we welcome your queries. If you spot anything that you don't think is right, then please report it to us. We're, we welcome um, feedback like that, and we'd like to hear from you as the data users. We have a blog as well, and we have a frequently asked questions page on our website. And the final point here is if you'd like to subscribe to Kemble for, to find out when the next um, Kemble release would happen, then we have a, a mailing list there that um, doesn't overload you with emails, but will tell you when the next release and other important information to do with Kemble comes out. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm sure myself and Barbara are happy to take any questions. Oh, and acknowledgements. Thank you, Barbara. So I'd like to acknowledge the whole of the chemical biology team. Andrew Leach is our team leader, but equally we have quite a large team at the moment. And this builds on work of previous team members as well. And we support three different resources. There's Kemble that we've talked about today and Unichem, but equally the, um, we've mentioned in passing the Sure Kemble database, which is for patent information. Thank you very much. <laughs>